<laughs> All right. So the socket programming, basically an API. Well, we can just move to the next slide. It's basically an API. So if we look at it, you know, you're writing your user application here, client server. We'll talk about client server multiple times, but a client server application, the server's waiting for clients to connect. So, you know, web server, whatever, and you're going to write servers. And then the client over here wants to talk to the server and we need to use the protocol stack. Well, it turns out that this part of the protocol stack is in the kernel of your operating system, typically. Now there, there's certain operating systems are moving more and more to move that to user space and there's reasons for that. But traditionally and in to, including today and what you're working with, that's kernel code. And it's a good thing because I don't want you directly messing with the ethernet NIC. Right? I, don't, I don't want you to be able to, you as a user, mess with the Unix 3 Ethernet NIC. That just would not be a good thing. So all that stuff is protected by the kernel, including TCP and IP. Well, how do we typically access resources in the kernel as a C programmer? System calls. System calls. And that's what the socket API is. This is these are system calls. And so you can look at it. I'm going to redraw this slightly as that sort of where the kernel is, right? So part of the system call is in user space and part of the system call is in kernel space. And its goal in life is for you to set it up with whatever parameters it needs and then trap to the kernel, right? Let the kernel execute the function and then come back. We got that? That's what a system call is. And so there's no magic here other than with the socket API, it's just a set of functions that are horribly written. Okay, that's, that's like the definition of socket API, horribly written set of functions, but we have to live with them because that's what we have. Okay, all right. By the way, they were written by Berkeley and Dr. Nico went to Berkeley. So feel free, you can just give him all sorts of grief and say, wow, I'd be embarrassed if my university came out with, of course, Everybody in the world uses Socket API, so it's actually really famous and probably a good thing for them. But I would still say I'd be embarrassed if my university came out with code like that. Just, I just say that to them. I've also been told this handwriting is messier than mine, and I, I take that as a compliment. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Uh, I, I'm not sure how he does it because I barely read my own handwriting. But anyways, okay. So let's talk about. Um, so we're going to talk about a client and a server here for a second. We're going to start with TCP. Uh, in this lecture, we will touch on UDP, but we won't really spend much time on UDP. We will do UDP later in the quarter when it's closer to when we're going to use it in, in programming, in the lecture and lab, in, in lab and the programming assignment. If I teach it now, you just forget it all and, and it, it's not all helpful. So we're just going to stick with mostly with TCP through this discussion. And so on a client and a server, so the first thing is the server has to be run first because the server is waiting for a client to connect. So, you know, we go back to our always to our picture, right? Well, here's the server and it's, you know, waiting for somebody to connect to it, right? A client to connect to it. And then another client can connect to a server, right? And if it's a web server, right, we might have many clients connecting to it, okay? And so the server starts first and we're gonna to have to look, we're gonna look at one at a time. We're gonna go through these functions. There's the socket function, which begins to set up, uh, begins to establish stuff in the kernel. Then there's a couple more kernel setup functions that we're gonna need. And then, and then finally, the, the, the server's gonna call accept. And this is a blocking call. And what do I mean by blocking? Well, until something comes in for it, that call doesn't return. Okay, it's just going to sit there and block, tip traditionally, sit there and block waiting for a client. Now let's look at what the client's doing. The client also is going to create a socket. And then the client's going to call a function called connect. The connect then begins to establish a connection with the server. And so this is TCP is connection oriented. What's that mean? Set up and tear down. Set up use and tear down. And so this is the setup part, these two calls here. There's actually going to be, and we'll see this when we get to TCP, there's actually an exchange of information underneath, you don't see it, underneath that's being done by TCP to set up that connection. And then once the connection's set up, we can use it. And we use the function send and receive. 
And that's just sending data back and forth. And then the final thing is we can close it, which is the teardown. And we'll go into more into detail on the setup using teardown of TCP in terms of what's going on under the hood when we get to the TCP part of the class. Um, from a programming standpoint, these are the functions that we need to use. The socket API functions. So the, the first function we're going to look at is the socket function. We're just going to go through those functions and just talk about what they're doing and, and take away any kind of mystery there, right? Is a socket call. Well, when the Berkeley people were thinking of doing this, they said, well, what abstraction do we already know about? Well, we already know how to do file I.O. And when we do file I.O., what do we call? We call open. And we give it some stuff. And what is open return? File descriptor. A file descriptor. Now, I, I want to point out, and this is important, open is a system call. Socket is a system call. Almost all of the system calls return less than zero on error. Now, let's, let's talk about stir copy. Okay. What is, is stir copy a system call or not a system call? Well, it's effectively like mem copy with error checking. Um, so it's but, just a function that's run yeah. in your user space. So, I mean, if, if we go, you know, here's, here's your, you know, here's your virtual memory that's allocated to your program when it's run, right? So you're in your virtual memory and, you know, here at some place in here is the stir copy code. I can't even read that. Okay. I mean, just in your space where well, your program space and here's some more of your code, right? So your code is all down here someplace. This is your code and stir copies in there. And so when you call it, it just jumps to the memory location in your, in your virtual memory and runs that code. No big deal. But when we make a system call, there's actually, it's going to jump into the kernel, which is not your memory and run code in here. Okay. So if stir copy has an error, most likely a seg fault because you forgot a null terminated something, your program knows it immediately. That's a great thing. Boom, bam, done. I got it. There's an error. But if there's an error, let's say you don't give it enough buffer space or a bad something or other, and it happens in the kernel, the kernel's not going to seg fault, thank goodness, right? Because then you would just be freezing your machine every time you screwed a system call, right? So what's going to happen is the system call is going to stop and it's going to return minus one. And if you're not checking for that, then an error is occurring over here and you have no idea that it occurred. So it's completely different than making normal calls. And it's very important that you check your system calls for errors. Because if you don't, you may spend hours and hours debugging it because it's not working in the kernel and you don't know it because you're ignoring the return value, okay? It's very easy. Anytime you make a system call, you just check, is it less than zero on the return? And if it is, you, you print out a P error, right? With some, you know, string in there and then exit, you know, minus one or something like that is typically what I do. So coming back up here, it returns a file descriptor. And if we look at what happens there, let's go back to our, you know, our virtual memory space. So let me redraw my picture. So I'm just going to take some space here. Here's my virtual memory, right? And, you know, my file descriptors and they point into the kernel. And so, you know, standard ends right here. And it's really pointing to a structure in the kernel that is standard in. And so when you make the system call to print something to standard or to read something from standard in, it's actually going to be a system call and it's going to go access some memory in the kernel that contains information about standard in and it's going to do that. Remember, our file descriptor zero is standard in, one is standard out, and two is standard error. So if you open a file, the lowest socket number, the lowest file descriptor you're going to get is three, right? And so, all right, so let's go back. Well, they said, well, why don't we use the same kind of idea on sockets? And so we'll open a socket, which is really a network connection, but then we can, in a sense, read and write to it. And so that's what they did. And so the socket call is socket, and then we'll look at the parameters in a minute, right? And it returns a file descriptor which by the way, you're gonna check for less than zero because it turns out that it returns minus one on error, okay? 
So it returns a file descriptor. So if we go back to the here, right? So we got standard in, standard out, standard error. And then if we call socket, the next one is three and it'll create a, a structure in the kernel for your socket. And if you call socket again, it creates another structure in your kernel for that other socket. And each one of those is gonna be a communication thing that we're setting up, okay? The point I'm trying to make here is they're file descriptors. They're in the same file descriptor table. They're doing the same thing that when you open a file and that they're setting up space in the kernel for your communication or for your talking back and forth. Okay. Just like reading and writing to a file. Okay. All right. We're going to use instead of read and write, we use receive and send are the, are the, in TCP are the functions. We'll get to the other functions when we get to UDP, but receive and send are how we read and write to a socket. All right, there's two types of sockets we can create. We can create a TCP socket, we can create a UDP socket. And in the TCP socket, if we're going to create it, we're gonna specify the, the macro sock stream for UDP and we'll go into the detail on that as sock dgram. But for TCP, and this is what we're mainly concerned with is sock stream. So let's look at the call to it. Here's the prototype. There's the address family, the type and the protocol. For us, we'll always use the address family of AF INET6. And um, that's what AF is address family. And then INET6 is the Internet 6 protocol. It works for both IPv4, which is the common protocol we use now, and IPv6 is the one we've been migrating to since 1992. So it's a slow migration. Okay, just it's tiny migration slowly, but we're almost there. We'll be there in now 10 years. Um, Okay, uh, so this is what we use in this class. You could use something else. You could use AFINet, which was just IP, TC, uh, version four. Uh, there's also one just for version six, but this does both four and six. And then the, the type will be SOC stream and the protocol is zero. And essentially what this does is, you know, here's our virtual memory. Here's the kernel and it's setting up that data structure in there. And it's basically saying, by the way, you're a TCP and you're using the normal TCP protocol and you'll never use anything but zero. And so in theory, you could just have, you know, they could have created a function called int TCP socket and only had one parameter, which is four or six, right? I mean, but no, they had to have all this, the protocol is zero and all that. No one ever wrote a nicer, cleaner interface to sockets that we use. This is just what we use, all right? So we'll look at a call to, to that. IPv6, TCP socket, protocol zero, check for errors. Always use your P error function, it's your friend. And um, there's our call to socket. Remember your parentheses, because you're setting something, you need a parenthesis there and there for precedence reasons. All right, simple. Any questions? Uh yeah, actually, why we have file descriptors. This is a file descriptor. Why are we not treating it like a file? We could. You can actually read and write to a socket. Just don't do that. Okay. So, so we use send okay. and receive because it makes it easier for us to debug our code because we can follow through. Oh, there's a send. I know that's a socket. But you could actually call the function read and it would read from that socket if there was data available, just like the receive does, but it makes your code harder to debug. So we use send and receive as, as the protocols. So are send and receive just wrappers around read you, and write? You, you, or do the kernel, you do the kernel digging, right? They, they okay. actually have an extra Fair option, but I'm not, yeah, that one is gonna depend on your operating system and everything. Cool. All right, so now, now we got the socket idea down. Cool. All right. Now, if I have, oh, well, if I write to stand to, to file descriptor zero and you write to file descriptor zero, what effect does your writing to file descriptor zero have on me writing to file descriptor zero? And two programs. We're both running, we're both running our own programs. There should be no effect. No because effect. It has its own uh, file descriptor table. Right. And the file descriptor table is local to me. So if I call the function socket and it returns socket number seven, 
does that help anybody communicate with me? That socket number. Like if I told you I have socket number seven, can you talk to me with that? No, it's local to my process. And so if we have, you know, we have a mail client and a browser. So that's a web, web, a web browser, right? And then over here on our server, we're running a mail server and a web server. Now, both of these called socket. And they both got file descriptors. Can we use that information to, for the client to connect to the server? No. I mean, that's probably part of it, but. It's actually not because the problem is with the socket number is that is only local to you. So it has no global information. So the kernel doesn't know socket seven is my socket seven because you could have socket seven too and the other process could have socket seven and somebody could have a file that's opened on file descriptor seven. They're all the same, right? And there's no way for the kernel on the way up for it to pick who to go to based on that. We're going to need some other piece of information that will allow the mail client to come up the kernel and talk to the mail server and the web client to come up the kernel and talk to the web server. We're going to need a piece of information. Do you see the problem I'm trying to solve or we're trying to solve here? Okay, what, what can anybody think of? And don't, if you know the answer, don't say it, uh, but can anybody think of something that might work there? Um, just from Trace, my immediate thought is that's what ports are for. Okay, port number is, is the correct answer, but a lot of times I get somebody to say that like the process ID, like why couldn't you, the process ID, like this has a process ID and this has a process ID, right? Why couldn't we use the process ID? Well, the problem is, is every time you run your server, it gets a different process ID. So how could you connect? How could you, how would somebody over here ever connect to you? They, they would have to know your process ID for that day. And so that's not practical. So what they came up with is this ID of a port number. And, and when I first heard about port numbers, I thought physical, something. No, no, it's just a number maintained by the kernel that's only given to one connection. So like if I open a socket and get a port number, I get that port number and nobody else on the machine can have it. And if you open a socket and then you ask for a port number and you get a port number at one, it won't be the one I have. And two, it'll be unique on the machine for you. And that way the kernel, and that's what maintains the port numbers and port numbers are maintained by the kernel. The kernel then knows where to send it to. Now we're gonna map the port number to a socket number, but the socket number's local, the port number's global. Does that make sense? Okay. We're still going to talk, read and write to the socket like we do any file descriptor, but we have to, we call it bind the socket to a port number so that it has that endpoint of the connection for the rest of the world. And so for this mail client here to talk to this mail server, there's three pieces of information that are needed. One is just the protocol family which isn't as obvious, right? And that's just AFI net. If I had six, okay, that, that one you wouldn't have gotten. But the other two might make more sense to you. One is it needs to know the IP address of the server because it's got to go across the network. And so one is the IP address of the server. And the last thing it needs is now that it got to that IP address, it's got to go up the kernel to the mail server. And so it's going to need the port number. port number of the server, port number the server is using. And these three pieces of information are called naming the socket. In theory, that name is worldwide unique because there's only, should only be one in theory server with that IP address. And then on that server, there should only be one server waiting on that port number, right? So it's, you get to the server on the IP, you get to the application based on the port number. Professor, what is that in uh, parentheses on number one? I can't quite read the handwriting. Yeah, AFI net six. All right, so let's see. The port numbers are maintained by the operating system or the kernel, but both the client and the server have a port number, right? Now we only care really about the server's port number. And so on the server to get a port number, right? We've already called socket. The next thing is how do we get a port number? So on the server, 
we need to explicitly ask for one. And we do this calling the bind function. Mm. And that's on the server. On the client, on the other hand, if you send on a socket without a port number, one is assigned by the kernel. So what we're going to see is on the server, we're going to ask for it because we need to know it. On the client, we don't care. And so we're just going to let the kernel implicitly give it to us. But I have a quick question about ports. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the, the link between two sockets that has a port number? Or is like each socket is its own structure in memory that has its own port number? I'm not sure I understand the two halves of the question. I mean, it sounded to me like they're both the same. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, I guess I just, I don't really see like why why we care about the client's port number if... Uh, oh, okay, yeah. let's go back to our figure, right? So now the server is sending back to the client and it has the IP address of the client, it would need that. And so that gets it back to here, but now that packet needs to go back up to the mail client and not the web client, right? And so how does it make the decision to do that? Well, it makes that decision based on the client's port number. And so really every packet that goes out has the client's IP, the server's IP, the client's port number and the server's port number. And that uniquely identifies a complete end-to-end -end connection, right? And I can use that to talk both ways. And so I need all four pieces of information for sort of the two-way communication. All right, so ex in, explicitly by the server, implicitly, we just get it when we send. So here's the bind call, by the way, it returns less than zero on error. This is a call that you typically uh, get wrong. Okay, this is one of them, those that I find more likely the students will get wrong. And so, and I've had students come and spend four hours debugging, wondering why their communication is not working and it's their bind call. So please make sure you check this one. Um, uh, I just answered that question implicitly and explicitly. Um, there are a set of reserve ports. So the question comes off, well, when you use your web browser, do you ever put a port number in there? You, you put a name in there, google.com, right? Yeah, well, how, does it get, you do that. how does it get, to, you know, sometimes you can, but how does it get to the port number Google's on? Well, they're called well-known ports or reserved ports. And well, all web traffic, if it's unencrypted, goes to port 80. Okay, and so and that's just well known across the world. So your browser knows when you put in www.google.com, it's gonna go to port 80 at Google. That's what it's gonna do, all right? And if you're doing you know, an email protocol, there's different protocols for the different, uh, the different port numbers for the different email protocols, but it's gonna go to whatever the well-known port number is for that, that email protocol and connect to the server using that. And so these reserved or well-known are used for servers that we use all the time for, for reserve and they're reserved. You cannot, these typically are between zero and 1024 and you can't use a port number between zero and 1024 without root on most machines or admin privileges on most machines. And the reason is, is they don't want you trying to start up a web server when they want to run a web server themselves. Like the IT people want to run a web server on the machine. And if you could start off a web server, you'd actually block them from running their own web server because you'd grab port 80. Okay. So uh, they don't want you to do that. Here's the bind call, the prototype for it. Um, it takes the socket you want to name. Remember, we're naming the socket. It takes the name of it, which is the IP address, the family and the port number. And then this is just the length of that. Here's the family structure. Now I told you that Berkeley came up with an extremely ugly thing. This is the structure that, that we have to use and populate. Now I, I would that it's not the most user-friendly structure in the world. Okay. So we're gonna set this one. To, I, I got code coming. Oh, here it is. Here's the code, right? You set this to uh, AFI net six. Um, and then the next is the IP address, which is this field here. 
Now you now let's talk about that for a second. I'm on a computer. I write some code. I run compile it. It runs. I then move it over to Unix two. Okay, Unix two has a. I was on Unix one. I moved to Unix two. Unix two has a different IP address. Well, if I hard code the IP addresses in my program, it's going to be very hard for me to make my code portable. So there's instead a value called uh, in six address, and he says any of the port, any of the physical IP, any of the IP addresses this computer has, connect to those. So you don't have to know you don't have to know what the uh, the IP address is of your computer. You just give it this parameter, which is what we use all the time. And then the final thing is we have to set is the port number. Now, if I was a web server, I would I could set my port number equal to host to network short 80. And then that would be saying, I want to use port 80. And now if I'd root, I could do that. And there's no other web servers doing it. If on the other hand, I put the number zero in here, zero means give me a random port number. So it's made up by the kernel. That's what we typically use for our programs because we're not well-known programs, right? You're not a program. You don't have a port number that you, you want specifically. So you'll just say, give me a random one. It'll give you a random one. And then it, you print it out and then you know what it is. Okay, and so uh, if you say zero, now what is the effect of host and network short on the number zero? Also zero. Well, yeah, also zero. No effect, right? I mean, zero is all zero bytes. It doesn't matter if it swaps it or not, it's still all zero bytes. Now, I don't care. You just always call this function because if you forget to call it, your program's not going to work the way you think it should um, because you'll get your port number and it'll be in a regular format and you'll type it in and you don't change it to network order and it's not gonna work correctly. Okay. Now we only need these three. And in fact, I, I hope that I'll have to check my code that I'm gonna give you. Last, the code I was giving last quarter didn't initialize the entire structure to zeros. In other words, I didn't just zero out the whole thing. And one student in the whole class had problems because he was, I don't know what architecture he was on, was getting garbage in there and it was just faulting out there. Um, they just have a lot of fields we don't care about um, and they need to be initialized uh, at least on some machines to zero. Uh, and so I got to check my code, make sure that I actually updated that code rather than just worked it with him. Um, but the other fields we don't care about. Any questions on that? So this is really it, plus zeroing it out. Here's, a, here's, our, here's our use of the, the socket call, setting up a TCP socket. Here I'm naming the socket, right, by calling bind, which is taking this information, right, and assigning it, getting it assigned to that socket. Okay. How does, um, how, so if you have two programs, two processes talking to each other, client, server, or servant, client, how does one know the other one? That's the, like the setup, the connection base, so, the setup. So first of all, the client needs to know the server's port number. Okay. And you'll give it to it at runtime, right? The browser already oh, knows okay. it's port 80, but in your case, because it could be some random number, you don't know what your port number is going to be. You'll print that out and I'll show you in just a minute how to do that. You'll print that out. And then when you run the client, you'll pass it in as an argument saying, hey, use this port number. Um, oh, okay. That's the way it works. So there is prior knowledge, like the client has to know where it's going first. Yes. So let, let's look at setting this up, right? Not and by the way, when I talk about setup use and teardown, this is not ne this is not the setup of that. This is actually just calling some functions to get the kernel ready. We call socket and we call bind, okay? And uh, we're going to call a function called listen, and I'll, I'll cover that in the next slide. And then we're gonna call a function called accept. So we haven't covered these yet and we're getting there. And then on the client side, we're gonna create a socket and we're gonna call connect, 
which is going to match up. So we now have to talk about this. So the server needs to accept new connections. So the server calls listen and then calls accept. And the client's going to call connect. Listen is only called once. Let's talk about, let's see, is that on the next slide? Yeah, oh, it's right here. What well, listen is called once, you give it the socket number and you give it the backlog information. And what is, let me tell you what listen does really quickly. It, it's what listen does is it tells the kernel, by the way, I'm a server. I'm going to have incoming connections coming to me. And if I don't get to them, you need to buffer them until I can open the connection. I can, I can accept them because it's going to accept them in a loop. It's, but if it doesn't get to them right away, because maybe 30 people try to, con try to connect at the same time, the kernel needs to buffer them. And what the backlog says is how many to buffer. That's all it is. It's setting up kernel, kernel space for you as a server. Uh, the Linux max is 128. We always used five or 10 in the classes I took because we're, we're not really a professional server. So there's not many connections coming in simultaneously. I mean, your server might have 300 connections in it. That's fine. But if they didn't all come simultaneously, they don't need to be buffered by the kernel. I, I laugh because it's like, you could, a lot of these functions aren't even needed. A lot of these parameters are never used and they're special cases. So you could have written a library with special cases and then the normal case would have been so simple to do, right? Real simple, but it's not what they did. So. We, we go through it. And, and by the way, most of this stuff exists in Python. So if you look at using socket programming in Python, you have to call this and you still have to call these functions. All right, so that's the listen function. And then the accept function, um, it actually ends up uh, establishing the connection with the client. And this is a blocking call, meaning it's gonna block until a client connects to it. As soon as a client connects to it, it returns. All right, on the client side, it's gonna call connect, right? So connect maps up with accept on the server. And the main, you know, we got, we're gonna call it with our socket. And the main thing here is this is the address of the server. So that's the server's address. And so that's got the family, you know, AF INET six, the server's IP and the server's port number go in that structure. Is the length just like the number of number of characters in that second parameter? Yeah, it's the length of that. So size of con construct or size of struct address adder would work. All right, so here's the connect system call. Here I'm setting up information about the server. Here's the server's port number. Typically we get that as a runtime argument. I convert it to an integer, put it in host network order. Now. What do you think bind returns? Let me see if I, where's my, okay, here we go. Socket bind. What do you think bind returns? What does bind do? Okay, somebody tell me what bind does. It, it associates a file descriptor that you have with a uh, port number, right? Yes. Okay, so other than Brandon, what do you think it returns? Probably the port it's number a... or just a success. Okay, you would wish it returned the port number, right? Because the only thing we really care about when we call bind is the port number or minus one for error, right? Well, it doesn't, it, it just doesn't. It's like, really? I, I mean, I was stunned when I first learned out, really? It, it doesn't return a port number? No, because that way we get to call another function to get the port number. Otherwise we wouldn't be able to call that other function. This actually gets us the port number. Get sock name, gets us the port number. So we bind it, the kernel gives it to us and this retrieves it for us. And then we have to print it out so that we can give it to the client so the client can run it. 
And so we printed out the port number and then we called listen and we called accept. Okay. Now, one other thing we got to come back here. I do want to talk about this. Now, do you know the IP address of Google? No, it needs to be translated, right? So you say www.google.com on the, on the line in your browser, it's actually going to translate that to an IP address using DNS, which we'll cover later, but it gets translated. Well, the same thing with your program. When you run your program, you're going to say, you know, client and then the machine name that the server's on, like unix1.csc.calpoly.edu, and then the port number. Well, that's not an IP address either. And so we need to get that translated. And that's what this function does here. This translates a name to an IP number and it uses domain name service or DNS. All right, so it's gonna use DNS to get that port number. So that not only is the system call or a call outside your process, it actually leaves your machine and it's gonna to go to another machine, which is gonna to go to other machines and do other lookups. And then finally, something's gonna return back to your machine and you can move on. So this call can actually take multiple seconds the first time you do it, uh, if you go to a machine you've never been to. Okay, so we got connect and accept. And then the next thing we have to talk about is here, send and receive, and then I think we're there. And so what does bind actually return then? Uh, minus one on error, and I can't remember uh, when it's correct or not. Maybe it's just that it, I don't know, something that's <laughs> not, something that's not zero, or might be, actually it might be zero. You'd have to look it up. But the important thing is it doesn't return the only thing we care about, which is the port number. All right, so now there's another trick in here that TCP plays. We do this stuff only once in our program, but for every new client, we have to call accept, All right? So client one calls connect, server calls accept. Client two, another client over here calls connect, server calls accept. Well, how do we process those? How do we make it so that the server can talk to multiple clients. Well, it turns out the server returns a new socket number for every single accept that it does. So I call socket, the function, get socket, get file descriptor three. I call accept, somebody connects to me, I get file descriptor four. Somebody connects to me again, I get file descriptor five. Somebody connects to me again, I get file descriptor six. And each one of those sockets is the one, are the sockets we're gonna use to talk back to the client. We never use this. This is only our main server socket. The only thing we do on that is we accept on it. It's the only thing we ever do. If we're going to send and receive, it's always on the new sockets that are created. So if we look at it, the way that it works is, you know, we've got our main process here on the server. And it's, you know, we could say a while one loop. I don't know what it is. And then it calls accept. I need more space. Right. And one way to think about it is then what we could do is we could fork a child. And that child is going to, you know, send and receive using whatever S2 is. Then we're gonna go back up and we're gonna accept again and we'd fork another child. So this is one connection, but this is gonna send and receive on a new socket that was created when accept returns. And that's one way you could do it. Another way to do it, this is, this is using fork in program two, you're gonna use one process. And every time a client connects, you're gonna get a new port, new socket number and you're gonna use that socket number uh, to talk to that client, you're going to watch that socket. And if something becomes available, you'll talk back to that client and you'll have to keep track of all that. But this is how we can talk to many clients um, not simultaneously, not sending to them all at the same time, but I can talk to you and I can talk to this one and I can talk to that one because in my space, I have a different socket number 
which is actually connected to you, and a different socket number connected to the other person and so on. And that's because accept returns that new socket number. So we go back so to our- uh, I was wondering if this means that uh, like on a, on a typical web server, they have a child process for every current connection, currently active connection. So there, there's three ways to manage multiple clients simultaneously. One is the way we're going to do it in program two, which is the, you're going to have one process and that process has many open file descriptors or many sockets and watches them all simultaneously. It's looking at them all and one becomes ready. It processes that one. So you can look at it, you know, you've got a huge bunch of, you know, open, open sockets and you're watching them all and each one's connected to a different client. And when one of them becomes ready, you process that client. And then, oh, then this one became ready and we process that client. And then it's the same one is ready and we process it and the other ones don't become ready, but we're going to watch them all simultaneously and process anything that comes in. That's one way to do it. Single, it's a single process. Another way to do it is through forking. Um, Forking is sort of a heavyweight process, uh, and, and when you every time you fork, you uh, actually create a new process, new virtual memory. Um, they've done a lot to improve it, but it's considered a little bit of a heavier thing. And then the third is using threads or p-threads, and p-threads are, are are creating threads within the same process, and that's a, they're called lightweight threads. And the reason is is because you're using the same virtual memory; they're quicker and easier to create less overhead, but they have some other issues that go along with them. But those are the three ways for a server to talk, to manage multiple clients. I'm not sure like what Google does in Chrome, but I'm pretty sure it's more like the lightweight process um, idea than any of the others. Um, so just a quick question about forking, uh, using, a, using a fork and using multiple child processes. Uh -huh. um, don't you have to be wary of like running out of your parent process, running out of file descriptors just in general? Actually not in forking. So in threading you do, because in threading you're the, every time you open a file descriptor, it's in the same space and it's open until you close it. When you fork, the parent can actually close the new socket and yeah. the child closes the parent socket. So there's only really one socket open in each process, even though you may have many, many clients yeah. The server doesn't keep track of those sockets. It just it just forks a child, closes a socket, forks a yeah. child, closes a socket. Well, if you, if the uh, parent or the client or the child forgets that, it's a problem. But just make Not sure that you don't child. forget it. Not as much the child, but yes, if the parent forgets to close the new socket, then it'll just continue to get more and more file descriptors open until it runs out. And there is cool. a limit to the number of file descriptors you can have. All right. Any questions on this? Don't worry, you'll get a chance to play with that. I, no one ever gave me this lecture. We didn't have it. And, and the thing is, uh, uh, every time I give it, I think about, wow, I can't believe they actually wrote it this way. It's just like the first thing that comes to mind now. It's like, really? Um, okay. And they've come up with newer functions for other things, similar functionality that are even worse. And I'm like, really? They didn't learn in the 30 years since they created them the first one that uh, do that with the new ones? No, they didn't. So. All right, uh, here's UDP. So in UDP, the server calls socket bind, prints out the port number, right? So that prints out the port number. And then instead of using send and receive, they use send to and receive from. We'll talk about the differences than that. But here's how we do UDP. Here's how we do TCP, which is simpler. I mean, UDP doesn't have a setup or a teardown phase, so it's probably going to be a lot simpler to set up or to manage it, like okay. a, not a connection, but like a transmission of data. So good, good identification, right? So UDP does not have the setup and, and teardown. That that is correct, but it's actually the negative of UDP, and you're going to find this out when you get to write program three, is because when you screw up TCP. It tells you immediately if you're checking for errors on your system calls that you screwed up. It'll say you screwed up. If you screw up on UDP, it doesn't care. It just says, oh, you dropped this on the network and it's totally wrong. Well, well, psh, I don't care. And it doesn't tell you what was wrong. And so it's, it's, the UDP is a lot harder to debug and you'll find that out when we get to program three. 
Um, but uh, but it, yeah, it's simp simpler to do because there's less calls, but okay. All right, so talking in TCP, we use the send function, which is very similar to the, to the write function and the receive function, which is similar to the read. Um, the receive, um, so our socket, the data, the data length, and then flags. Um, no magic there. If you've done reads and writes, send and receive is not, typically we'll use zero, except in your program too, there'll be a place where we won't use zero. I think this is my last, I got one more slide, but pretty much the last uh, TCP slide. Um, TCP creates a stream of data. So when you send and then you send again, TCP doesn't really differentiate it. It's not a one-to-one. -one. You send, you receive one. You send, you receive one. I send 10 bytes, you receive 10 bytes. It's not like that. If I send 10 bytes and then send 10 bytes, you may receive 20 bytes. You, you don't know what was sent. It doesn't tell you that. UDP very nicely does. And when we get to UDP, that's a great feature for us. But TCP doesn't. Well, this becomes an issue because I send you a message and then I send you another message and they're independent of each other. And I want them printed on the screen independent of each other, but you get them both at the same time. How do you tell the difference? Okay. And now in program two, we'll go over how you do that. But this is something we need to be aware of is that TCP creates a stream and it doesn't maintain boundaries between what you sent. And so if I send in two messages, networks rules, I could receive this, I could receive this, I could receive part of it, and then this, or most likely I'll receive that. All right, if I send it back to back, most likely it'll just put them together and I'll get it all in one chunk. And this, is a, uh, this can be a problem. You need to be aware of it and we'll spend a considerable amount of time in program two addressing that and solving that problem. So you're essentially saying that there's no F flush well, you can tell TCP, you can do some configuring to tell it not to, you know, to send it one-to-one, -one. but if they arrive at the same time sure. or you haven't gotten around to receiving them, the kernel is going to put them together. Mm. I mean, the kernel, even though you sent one, which was just the word networks and then, and it actually hit the wire and then you sent the second one rule and it hit the wire on the receiving side, if your client didn't go and receive them quick enough, They'll just be put together in the same buffer. And when you do your receive, you're going to get them both simultaneously. And so is that, I'm guessing that the NIC is what's determining this? No, it's no. TCP it's buffers for 125 milliseconds okay. uh, in its normal way. It won't send. If you've got data, it's going to try to group it together and then it's going to send it. But if you don't, let's say you're off in your user space doing something. And then finally you call receive. If multiple things have arrived since the last receive, you're going to get them simultaneously. You're just going to get them all at once. You said so the, the two messages are combined in the kernel, and then that's what is returned as one bit stream to the rec v call, or is it like the rec v call is still open for a very small amount of time and then no more? the rec v call will if there's something available, the rec v call so receive is um is a blocking call but if there's data it will return immediately with that data okay so but yeah two things arrived simultaneously or you know within a little bit of time you're gonna get both okay and the, this slide is a little bit just about running your servers um and your client when you run your server you need to output the port number because you have to pass it in like here i'm passing it into the client okay if you're running on the Unix machines, I found that I have to give it the whole name. You can also, in our programs, you'll be able to give it the IP address. We wouldn't do that necessarily on campus, but you might do it at home because your machines probably don't have uh, names to them. Uh, or you can use localhost, which just says use my, like if you're running it in two windows, here's one window and here's another window on your machine. This is the format you typically use, which is just localhost, which says use my current machine. Uh, this does the same thing as localhost. So, uh, barring like the slight architectural differences, would we be able to uh, develop on our local machines and then transfer the program over to the Unix servers like Trace? 
Yes, you can completely, and, and you can do that under Windows if you have the Windows subsystem for Linux 2. Even one might work, but I use two, Windows subsystem for Linux 2. Works perfect for all these all the assignments in this class. Macs work fine for them. Obviously, Linux works fine for them. I will say this, where you run into problems is you all have uh, memory errors and then you move it to the Linux servers and it finds those errors for you. And so give yourself time to debug it uh, when you move between machines. 